Hello, my name is Margo Morton. Today's date is Monday, April 1st, 2019. I'm interviewing Professor Lisa Driver on the Ball State campus as part of the Ball State University Honors College Oral History Project. Thank you, Professor Driver, for agreeing to participate in this effort, which we're conducting during this, the Honors College's 60th anniversary year. I'd like to begin by asking you where and when you were born. I was born in uh, Ayer, Massachusetts, when my father was part of the uh, JAG, uh, Judge Advocate General's Corps in the Army. And he was an attorney uh, in the Army and uh, an officer at the time, and writing wills for folks who were going over to Vietnam. And I was born there, and a year or two later, then I, we went back home to Indiana. And when were you born? 1965, January 9th. Okay. And why did you move back to Indiana? It was home. Uh, my mom's family is all from around the Vincennes, rural Vincennes area. My dad's family is all around uh, Peru, north of Kokomo. And can you tell me more about uh, your relationships with the people you grew up with, like your parents or any siblings that you have? Ah, uh, really blessed. Uh, my sisters and I continue to be really close friends. As an academic, you almost never get to go anywhere near back home. And my husband and I had hoped maybe one of us would get a job east of the Mississippi. So when I landed the job at Valparaiso University, and I'm only a little over two hours from my folks in Kokomo, I, it meant that my kids could have grandparents. And that's fantastic because their other grandparents are in Maryland. So. Um, yeah, a, a complication in that was related to my Ball State story in that my mom died after my freshman year in college, and then my dad uh, remarried the next year, and so we had, had a blended family at that point. And how did that affect you when your mother passed away? I was, I don't know, I, you'll think it's weird, but part of it in coming from a, a family that cared an awful lot about their Christian faith it, there was something kind of exhilarating to be at her bedside and to feel kind of in the core of your being that there's a resurrection going on. There, she, she made it to another dimension that uh, we missed her a lot. She was out of pain. Um, since she died in June, it meant the whole family was together. So, uh, well, I'd done a lot of back and forthing during my freshman year to, uh, to be at home. I'm the oldest of, my, uh, of our three these three girls and um, it was it was an interesting year it gives me a position of uh, compassion as a teacher now I've been through some things that I know some of my students are struggling with but how it affected me was uh, I guess not as much as my younger sisters who were still at home uh, they were the ones that probably bore the brunt of the difficulty of blending a family um, but also they were just younger and I was at a point where I was beginning to, to move off anyway. We still did a lot of stuff together and as I was going through my freshman and sophomore planners that I discovered in a bin, uh, I'm, I'm going back home periodically and we're still celebrating birthdays and having ice cream at my grandparents' farm and stuff like that. So um, I don't know, experience a loved one's death it was, it was powerful and it, it really kind of brought home things that I had believed but had never been in a position to, to really experience that deeply. So it was like at her funeral, it was exalting as well as uh, sorrowful and time of joy and a time of sadness. And yeah, so it didn't affect me all that much school-wise. I knew I had work, and so the thing that my parents wanted me to do was to do the best I could. And though I was going back and forth, and I was—I even found a diary from back then. It, I was—I was stressed. I was worried about everybody around me, but uh, I needed to do well in school. That was what I was here for, and they gave me space and encouragement to do that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Can you tell me the names of your parents and sisters? Yeah, my father is. Uh, John Conrad Moggins. Uh, there's a Conrad Moggins that came to uh, the United States from uh, kind of the Stuttgart region of Germany in the late 1600s. And uh, so the Conrad Moggins kind of kept going. Um, so uh, 
that's my dad, and he was born uh, in a rural area near Peru. Uh, my mother is uh, Judith Marie Moggins. She was born outside of Vincennes in a rural area. And um, my next youngest sister is Stacy Erin Moggins, and she's four years younger than I am. She's a professor at Valparaiso University as well in music, and uh, the, the enormous blessing of having family nearby for an academic or for anybody, it just, it just makes a huge difference to have family around. My youngest sister, Kristen, is nine years younger than myself, and she is in southwestern Wisconsin. She has about 20 dogs because she got into sled dog racing when she was getting her vet tech degree at Purdue after she got a bachelor's at IU. And uh, so she, she looks for winters that are particularly cold and snowy uh, in order to get those dogs out. She's a vet tech at University of Wisconsin-Madison in their ICU uh, area. My stepbrothers are still in the area. One of them is uh, in Kokomo. The other one is, um, I guess he's working around Amboy. His kids go to Maconaquah. Um, and you mentioned earlier uh, sort of your ties with Christianity, and since you're now a theology professor, <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you about your religious upbringing in yeah. your childhood. Well, the Honors College had something to do with me understanding more of that because the, the first year ID uh, history course that I took, I th it must have been, I'd have to remember, it was somewhere in the freshman year, but it was a family history program uh, course, and Vander Hill was teaching that, and that was really cool. But uh, we were to do kind of archival and interview work to create a family history, and I chose my grandfather, who was um, a pastor in the Church of the Brethren, but he had been brought to that position from the traditional means the Brethren did, which was to have um, lay elders who helped to uh, lead the community, and my grandfather ended up being the last elder standing. <laughs> uh, Others just weren't raised up. I'm not sure why. So he was full-time pastor at his uh, little church uh, and full-time farmer. And uh, I, I just loved him and my grandmother so deeply. They had such a, a quiet strength about them and open, open hospitality. Everyone was kind of welcomed like family when they came to my grandparents' house. They, they had... Uh, they had a wood lot in the back of their farm where they had set up a camping area and we'd go there and, and they would invite folks from, from the community and their church to, to do little camp outs there. And so I, I was really fascinated about kind of where, where my grandfather came from religiously and how fantastic. I mean, he could bring out the old photos. Uh, you know, they didn't have electricity at their house when they were little. There was a little pony that uh, my grandfather had used to, to get to different jobs, and they bought that pony back for his youngest son, my, my uncle Steve. And, you know, to see the little picture of the, of the pony and his little dog. So uh, that project was so fantastic to, to share stories and to learn more about where my grandfather came from and you know, the hard stories about um, brethren sometimes get uh, accused of a real harsh legalism and I mean I think that most farming communities to survive you got to be kind of tough and um, uh, he, he shared one story about uh, getting a high school class ring and he was really you know really happy to have his high school class ring and an elder came up and told him that's prideful and my grandfather never wore it again so there, there's kind of an unforgiving aspect of it that my grandfather did not become a legalistic sort of person, but just a deeply consistent, welcoming person. And um, so we went to the Church of the Brethren quite a lot, uh, visiting with my grandparents. They, they were the go-to babysitting place when, uh, uh, when my folks would go out on their own vacations over spring break, and we thought we got the best deal to hang out at the farm, go run around in the woods, play out in the fields. Uh, that, that was fantastic. Um, and so there was that side, and then my mother's side were Presbyterian, going back to whenever Presbyterian started in Northern England. I had a great aunt who was a genealogist, and she had tracked everything back, and. It, 
made a huge, thick uh, family history um, and, you know, tracked back the church where, where the, the family had lived. So they were very Presbyterian, and that's the church that I actually grew up in uh, until mid-70s or so, and my folks were concerned that uh, some of the traditional ways of, of living and believing as Christians were the church body was going kind of really far liberal. Um, anybody who grew up certainly in Midwest Indiana, it doesn't matter if you're Catholic or Presbyterian, there's an evangelical flavor to everything. And so that concern uh, that kind of morphed into moral majority, uh, concern about secular humanism and how academics have kind of taken over belief in the church. Uh, we ended up landing in the Lutheran Church, <laughs> which uh, was probably not anybody's kind of first go-to position, but uh, we had good friends there. We had uh, grown up listening to the Lutheran Hour that the uh, Missouri Synod uh, broadcast every morning. So we'd listen to that preparing to go to our church. And so we're familiar that way, but uh, to me it was, it was fantastic because I'd pretty much felt I'd outgrown the church by third grade. I knew all the Bible stories backwards, forwards, and to hit them again was like, um, been there, done that. But we had in the Lutheran church, it's like, we've got, we've got school every Monday, two, three hours, from fourth grade to eighth grade to do religious education. It's like, ooh, there's just a little bit more there that um, uh, I had not understood. And the liturgy itself and the new hymnody was like, wow, this is long and deep. And you look at the bottom of the hymnal pages and we're, we're singing poetry and songs that brothers and sisters of the faith have been singing since, you know, second, third century. Uh, and I was like, wow, they go back that far. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's a, a bit of my background that it, it had uh, been certainly part of how we functioned as a family. We had we were supposed to have um, like weekly devotions and stuff like that. That of course, when I got into high school, I got kind of annoyed at. But <laughs> the sense that this stuff mattered and it mattered to people that I loved and cared about, that I, I saw a great maturity in the way that they lived their lives, uh, that that affected me pretty pretty deeply. And you mentioned high school. Um, so can you tell me uh, the school you went to and what years you attended? Sure. So uh, I went to Western High School that's, uh, well, west of Kokomo. They had a very creative way of naming the county schools, Eastern, Northwestern, Western. Uh, so I went to Western High School and uh, it, is a, it was consolidated. So the whole campus has kindergarten through 12th grade. So I was there, I guess, when did I start kindergarten? Um, Anyway, I graduated in 1983, so takeaway must have been like 71. Yeah, they didn't have kindergarten at the time, so I started in 71. Okay, and so as you got older, like in those kind of high school years that they mm -hmm. would be, what sort of activities were you involved in at school? Way too much. <laughs> kind of story of my life until I finally had to figure out I had a finite amount of health and energy. Um, some of it was my mom's doing. She was a very strong personality. There were certain things she wanted me to be involved in and to get, take advantage of all the clubs and stuff. But uh, my first love was basketball. I was just a Hoosier at heart. My dad had played basketball in college. In the same uh, network, I later found out that, uh, uh, that Vanderhill had been playing in. So their schools had kind of played each other in basketball. And we talked a little bit about that, I think, at the Whitinger interview. So I wanted to be like my dad. I wanted, to, I wanted to be a college basketball player. And in the 70s and 80s, it was the beginning of women's uh, national basketball teams. And oh, I was going to do that. I, I loved it. I would watch my Saturday cartoons and work on my ball, ball handling skills. Um, and that came to an abrupt halt after my sophomore year in high school. Um, yeah, I had uh, I'd made varsity. I, it was just like the joy of my life. I started sometime on a team that went, I think it was 20 and two, and we lost by two points to Marion in the finals of the regional. Uh, I guess that would be, yeah, anyway, 81, 82, somewhere in there. And uh, after that, my mom was very concerned that I was spread too thin. 
in which case she was probably right, but she made an executive p decision that I wouldn't play basketball anymore. And um, that haunted me clear through, <laughs> clear into my 30s. I would just have these dreams. It's like, I know I still have two more years of eligibility left. And I, you know, I'd be trying out and I, and those dreams just kept coming back and back. It, it hurt so much. And uh, it took a while for, I think, my mom to understand how much I had wanted that. And even though, in retrospect, I can see, yes, I was spread too thin, I loved basketball. Oh, I, I just loved it in, the, in the, the best and worst Hoosier way. It was, uh, it was important to me. It was something I could do, I, I could excel at. Um, but then it stopped, and I was doing a lot academically, lots of clubs, history club, drama club, tried art club for a little bit. Um, uh, I was very active at church, particularly as a musician, and it was music that was taking a lot of time, uh, trying to make sure I'm getting my hour of practice in every day. And um, I played trumpet. I loved that. Uh, since I'd been in eighth grade, my church had opened and, you know, said, oh, you know, can you play it? Can you play for us? And there was another trumpeter there who was a musician who would get brass choirs and quintets together. And for an eighth grader to be asked to play for church, I, I was like, wow really and that was fun I did that for a long time I did that clear into Ball State in which several of the the folks who normally played together back at my home church had come here and so I, I saw in my planner again is like uh, Redeemer Quintet practice <laughs> and so I was like oh yeah we did that so we could practice here and be ready to go back to Kokomo and uh, and, and play there for different holidays and stuff so music took a huge amount of time, uh, in great part because our band went for um, uh, the marching band competitions starting my freshman year. And we went from kind of bottom of the pack to state champions in four years, which took enormous amount of time. And by my senior year, I was sick of it. It's five minutes of programming, really, and we're putting in like three weeks of eight hour day practices in the summer and then it's I was like no I I was sick of it and we won state I thought oh great now now we can get back to regular life my senior year and then they decided to go to a national competition which everybody was all excited about I was like no I'm not going just no <laughs> no 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 uh, which got me into a powwow with all of the band directors and they were calling my parents and stuff and not not angry worried because uh, In a small school they they knew my mom had been fighting with cancer since my freshman year in high school uh, They knew I wanted to spend more time with my family and uh, the thing that Convinced me to go is my mom said just just go enjoy it. Uh, it's okay and I was tired, I was exhausted, I really didn't want to go. It was a fun trip and all. We didn't do terribly well, but I was just exhausted and sick of marching band. And other people like my, my youngest sister really loved that marching band program, but I was, it wasn't the music that I really wanted to do. It wasn't the time I really wanted to spend, but I was in a leadership position by that point and kind of had to do it. So after you <laughs> graduated high school in 1983, um, you came to Ball State. So why did you come to Ball State? What were the <laughs> motivations behind that? Well, I had a, a guy I'd gone to prom a couple of times with. He was a fellow trumpet player who was a couple of years before me who was uh, in the Honors College. His name was Steve Wheeler. And we got on real well. We loved history. We'd talk English history and monarchy and stuff. And he was a lot of fun. And we'd been in 4-H together. And he was just, he was kind of like a brother, but he was kind of somebody I wanted to have as a boyfriend. And uh, so I'd, I'd visited Ball State a few times, often in conjunction with the um, literature competitions that the English department put on. I went two or three times. Our English teacher brought us out here. And that was lots of fun. And um, I also came in part because uh, the smart, the people I consider the smart kids in my class either went to become engineers at Purdue or to be really smart at IU or to go to someplace like uh, Earlham, to, which seemed to me kind of a, an elite place. And I thought, well, 
If I flame out and flunk at Ball State, nobody will notice. <laughs> uh, but uh, in choosing a college, I, again, I was looking through these bins of stuff, and I'm looking at this uh, big binder of my senior year and all of these accept acceptance letters and uh, the different places I visited, particularly uh, Anderson and uh, Taylor. Those were the two other places that I was considering, mainly because my family really cared a lot about an environment in which uh, my faith could be fostered. Their experience, or especially my mom's experience at Purdue uh, at a state university, was that religion wasn't anything anybody ever talked about at a state school, and if they did, it would be kind of um, critical. Uh, however, she came on one of the visits, and we were walking through the dorms, and people have Bible verses up on their doors and stuff, and she's like, that never would have happened at Purdue. <laughs> so she, she began to think that maybe, uh, you know, it might be safe to come. Uh, but uh, in the end, it was the Whitinger uh, that, that kind of clinched things in great part because uh, summer of my sophomore year in high school, my youngest sister had had open heart surgery uh, to fix a hole in her heart down at Riley. Uh, that cost a lot. Um, my parents had bought a hundred acre farm, mostly wooded, that was across the road from my grandparents' farm. That was kind of an investment and kind of a, to be a vacation place, a place to get away. Uh, Pipe Creek runs through it and it surrounds the Brethren Church that my, my dad grew up in. Eventually that's the church where uh, my husband and I were married. It is, but anyway, they just bought a hundred acre farm and um, ongoing kind of checks with my, Financially, it seemed to me the wiser use of resources for the family, knowing my younger sisters would be coming through for college. Uh, financially, to take the Whitinger, and uh, whether or not I thought I deserved that kind of award, uh, it, it just seemed to financially make a lot of sense to, uh, to try Ball State. And uh, I was happy enough with that choice because I felt a relief that I, I'd kind of earned my uh, my way in there and was helping the family out in that way but I was kind of nervous culturally about coming. Do you think your nervousness about that culture were those fears <laughs> kind of were they unfounded once you got here? Well yes and no. Uh, the, this this uh, enemy of secular humanism was really really ingrained in a lot of Midwestern Christian culture in the 70s and 80s. So uh, I remember being really nervous about having to take the humanity sequence because that seemed to be like secular humanities and maybe, you know, <laughs> it was like, eh. So my, my mom set up a, uh, a visit uh, with, uh, with our head pastor who was like, you know, you're gonna learn stuff, you're gonna read stuff, you know, just get the most out of it. And he was very calming and, and Intellectual inquiry in the Lutheran tradition was seemed to be much more of a concern than any other uh, the other Christian communities I'd been part of, so he was he was pretty chill with uh, with that. He just he was like, well, you know, you know what you believe, and and they can't take it from you. And it's like, well, okay, I'll settle down and see what happens here. <laughs> um, uh, big picture. Uh, actually being part of the Honors College and, uh, and, and a Whitinger, I got here and start meeting other Whitingers and Honors College kids and find out that a whole bunch of them were Lutheran. <laughs> and in fact, my, some of my closest friends and I ended up uh, all kind of keeping each other accountable about going to the Lutheran Chapel, Grace Lutheran University Chapel, Gluck, uh, as it was called. Uh, and uh, we would just, it was, we'd go every, every Sunday. Eventually I got a car, so I was the one that was taking everybody. And one time it was really super cold and I was, uh, we were like, we're tired or we want to sleep in. If the car doesn't start, we'll just stay home. And they're like, okay, that, the car started. And it was, it was like 30, 40 degrees below zero. It was really super cold. So the, the chance of a car that sits for like weeks on end starting, well, no, every Sunday we, we took it, but uh, yeah. So uh, what I found here is that uh, 
and what I'm telling my kids now, you find the community you look for. Uh, going through my planners, it was clear that within about three weeks, I had my core community that I had all the way through my five years at Ball State. And they, were all, they started out all as Whitingers. Uh, it was uh, me, Cindy Miller, uh, Gary Markwell, and uh, David Doherty. And the four of us, and others would kind of, they were kind of in the, in the mix with that. Uh, Michelle Weiss uh, was a year ahead of us as a Whitinger. And uh, she ended up marrying a, a Lutheran pastor. Uh, and we've kept in touch off and on from there. But yeah, so it was like, oh, they're really intelligent people who don't seem to have a problem doing this honor college stuff and don't seem to have a problem with Ball State. And uh, my first roommate, uh, was a Catholic and she and her friends were always going off to the Newman Center and I didn't know what a Newman Center was. But So uh, the community it made it, it was very clear as you got to know people, it was not going to be all that threatening. But I was taught right off the bat in Dr. Weyer's course that you need to think and you need to think tough and you need to have you need to know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's just, uh, it wasn't about for or against religion, it was just about taking the big stuff really seriously and encountering big ideas that matter to a wide swath of kind of historical, geographical humanity. And uh, that was scary uh, and, and very challenging. But um, so, yeah, my, my initial fears were not borne out to the extent that as my mom was dying uh, at the end of my freshman year, I took her and my grandmother, who was also having health problems, uh, and my mom, we went to Potato Creek State Park, rented a cabin probably only two weeks before my mom died. And my mom really wanted me to reconsider going to Taylor Anderson. And at that point, I really understood what her worries were. She was worried about her first kid. She was worried about the things she wouldn't be there for. She was worried about being there as a resource uh, and, a, and a friend now that I was growing into adulthood. And um, we had a really, really good conversation about her fears, my experiences. Uh, we always butt heads all the time because I think we're very similar, very strong-headed. She always won, uh, as in the basketball case, but she had a really good heart. And to have that conversation before she died in which she could be at peace with uh, the particular path I was on, that this was not going to, she didn't have to worry for my soul, uh, and that I, I had a way to you know, excel academically, to grow in that way, but to do so at the same time that my faith was growing was really important. Uh, my best friend, Cindy Miller, was uh, uh, daughter of a multi-generational Lutheran pastor, so <laughs> I, I I felt like I had an anchor there because she was used to talking theology all the time. She'd talk about family get-togethers and, you know, and, and her family had experienced the split uh, within the Missouri Synod that had taken place in the 70s, of which I was completely clueless about. We had come into the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, after the, the horrible split, and our congregation was fairly stable. Uh, I, anyway, I learned a lot from Cindy and her willingness to talk about these things, raise questions, uh, not take any guff from the uh, the skeptics in our group, which were David and Gary. <laughs> and they would have these fascinating philosophical, theological conversations. I, I just I just sat and listened to. It. It was like, wow, wow. I can't do this, but they can, and it's really fascinating. <laughs> And you mentioned uh, that you were here for five years because uh, you created your own major, had three minors. So can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit about that? Well, God bless Dr. Hendy. Having an honors advisor was brilliant. He just knew up one side, down the other, how all of these programs worked. And when I started kind of piecing out that that's really what I wanted to do and there wasn't a particular way to do that, he, was, he just started talking out loud. He says, you know, look and see if you can't make something. I was like, oh, I can do that. And, uh, so, uh, and I found, again, in my papers, I found the, uh, my proposal for the uh, um, medieval studies 
major in which I had used the minor for, I think it was Renaissance studies, that used uh, uh, English department, foreign language department, and history department together to, uh, to craft a kind of a uh, multidisciplinary period uh, ma major or, mi or minor. And I just upped the hours then until they, they reached the, the, the approximate hours that a major would need. And it allowed me to do fun stuff, like uh, I could bring in um, music history. I, I was uh, granted the right, uh, well, I knew Dr. Jackson because I, uh, in theory, music theory, because of uh, Cindy uh, in music. And I'd done stuff in music with my trap. I'd played in the band at least one year. But anyway, I got to take the music major's version of music history, uh, the early section that went up through the Renaissance, which was just fantastic. I, I loved my, my music appreciation course, but it was uh, it just so, so little skimmed the, uh, the surface. And I, I found one of my papers on, uh, we had to do music reviews. I found one of my papers from that, that class I had my freshman year, I think. And the, and the prof was writing, you know, you seem to love music as an avocation. Maybe you should think of it as a vocation. I thought, that's really nice. Uh, but I knew, I'd, I never had the ability to just relax and enjoy sharing the music. I just got too nervous. I got I was too perfectionistic. My sister, who became a professional musician and is, uh, uh, she's now department chair at Valparaiso University in music. When I went to her doctoral recital, I was like, this is somebody who enjoys sharing music and she can, she can do this and I don't feel nervous for her. And I just wasn't the person who could have been a performer, but I appreciated the I could sample kind of music life uh, and music major stuff to a certain extent. Um, but through that interdisciplinary major, uh, I just loaded it with stuff that uh, folks in English and history and uh, classics told me these are good things to put together. And Dr. Weekland helped out. Dr. Hoseski was, was fantastic because he was the one that I did my um, honors thesis with. Uh, and so to a certain extent, the main home of, of my major, I guess, was with Dr. Hoseski, although my classics profs gave me the tools linguistically to really uh, qualify for the world-class um, doctoral program I ended up in. Do you recall the, na the first names of Dr. Hendy and Jackson. And Bill Hendy. Mm -hmm. um, I should know Dr. Jackson's first name because he told us we could call him by his first name. Uh, him and, and Cooksey and Cindy and me, we would, Cooksey taught philosophy and I don't remember her first name either. We just called each other by last names. And Phil Jackson, I think, he was the music theory guy. Um, we would all sit together at the Whitinger banquets and stuff and just, exchange stories. I've got, I also found a, a funky little invitation, uh, stylized invitation that we shared with, uh, with um, Arna Wittig uh, on one of the Whitinger things. And we were just being goofy and we, it was like an inter-office memo about what we were going to do at the, at the Whitinger banquet. But yeah, it was uh, Cooksey and Jackson and me and Cindy and of course David and, and Gary. And yeah, those were fun. It was fun to be able to engage in a, I wasn't friends, but, but just to, to be that at home, to uh, engage with your, your professors. I, I would never have guessed when I started uh, college that, that, that one could do that. How do you think your college experience would have been different if you hadn't been in the honors program here? Oh, grim, I would have thought. but. That's me not being on the outside. Uh, the community that the Honors College developed uh, in, around the Johnson Complex was fantastic. And certainly it started for me with a group of Whitingers I just hung out with all the time. We, we met each other for lunch and dinner. And, uh, but I was also looking through my planners and, and noticed all the times that uh, not just me and Gary or me and Cindy went to uh, 
Emmons for various st various performances and all. So I just remember this kind of pilgrimage of Honors College students all walking down to Emmons together and dressing up and, and enjoying being able to be cultured and stuff. And of course, we were probably pretty snobby. Uh, I certainly remember walking past La Follette and, and feeling very justified in my snobbiness at all these people who were suntanning and playing volleyball. And what were we doing? We were going to class. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, so I don't know what it would have been like without that kind of community where it was normal to want to excel, to be curious, to try out things. Uh, and it was a smaller kind of college community uh, by having it residential. As I was kind of reviewing some stuff and, and Googling some stuff online, I ran into a, a history that um, I think Wittig and Vanderhill and Edmonds were writing about, I don't know, Ball State or something. But the, the, there seemed to have been quite the kerfuffle that Vanderhill was fighting to make sure that there would be an honors college community. And I am so glad that he did. Um, my husband lived in a, went to the University of Delaware. They had an honors college of sorts, but it wasn't quite a community. And all it did was kind of put people in advanced courses. <laughs> Uh, we had these, these really cool topics that we could choose from, and we could keep seeing each other and particular professors over and over again, not in our major necessarily, but uh, it, just, it was so rich, and it was topics that I was fascinated by. Um, so I don't know what it would have been like outside of the Honors College. I just know that I, there were people I could always go to if I had questions, things that I could... Uh, explore because I knew other people had explored it. Can you tell me about your professor Richard Wires? Because <laughs> I know you mentioned that he was a very noteworthy professor while you were here. Oh yeah, well Wires was intimidating and uh, I understood that he demanded, requested, somehow got every freshman Whitinger in his freshman humanities course which was really good for us. Um, I'm not sure what it did for his collegiality, but I, I was, he seemed to be the epitome of uh, a cultured, highly educated, highly intelligent person uh, who, who was going to demand that we got up to his level, demand that we, which I knew I couldn't. <laughs> so I, I, for the most part, just kind of sat there and absorbed stuff and I remember him saying, I don't know if it was just to me in particular, he's like, well, you know, it, there was the, this, you know, the saying of still waters run deep. He didn't think that still waters actually ran deep, that if you didn't have anything to say, it probably meant that you didn't have much to say. And I, I felt that keenly that I needed not only to kind of absorb, but be able to participate in some way. And I saw Cindy and Gary doing this all the time. They would argue and they'd take this passage and that. And I was like, so I, I feel like I spent a lot of my undergraduate going, wow, <laughs> watching other people be brilliant. Uh, but Wires, in my writing and the feedback, and I, had, I was looking over some of the papers he graded, I did well in thinking and writing, and he was very encouraging on it. He, he didn't write tons of stuff, but uh, he had high standards. And um, so we were reading this fantastic literature and he invited us to his condo. I didn't even know what a condo was. <laughs> and we're going behind this gated community and we're going, wow. Wow is my, is my word because I, they're just one after another, some just fantastic opening the world up for me. And uh, this was one of them as we were going to Wire's condo and we come in and there's a baby grand in there and he's got books all over the place and really tastefully, richly uh, decorated. And we're going into his little study library and there, just by the chair is some book written in French. I'm like, wow, somebody can actually read French. This, this has got to be a really smart guy. Uh, so uh, to treat us as freshmen, to invite us to his house and uh, I remember I'd, I'd taken some piano lessons. My mom had taught, had taught us or tried to teach us. And I had been working on some little Debussy piece. And uh, I was playing the beginning of it because I'd never been able to play on a baby grand. And he was on the other end of the condo. I thought, this will be fine. You know, I can try this out. And uh, 
just it was really cool to be able to play on, on his piano. And, uh. So when things came around to do colloquia, I definitely wanted to take his Nazi Germany colloquium. And uh, just his little booklet of all these terms that were part of the, the Third Reich. I, I, was, I, I was a word-oriented person. I actually asked for an uh, etymological dictionary for Christmas one year. Because I love the, the stories behind these words. And, uh, my kids just look at me now as like, no, my mom is such a goof. Um, but I, I love the stories of words, and so uh, being introduced into some of the specific terminology and the stories that are behind those words as they're shaped into uh, the Nazi society, I, I was really fascinated by that and by just kind of exploring why people would be drawn into this, what was the rationale, uh, and then uh, the biggest thing I remember after that was being introduced to the, the French film Night and Fog, which was just, I don't know if, it was a powerful, powerful picture at the atrocities of the concentration camps that uh, the French had made, this French documentary guy had made, so that the world would not forget. It was made probably early 50s or something like that, but using a lot of um, uh, Nazi uh, propaganda footage as well as looking at the, the current ruins of Auschwitz. Um, it was, I'd never seen much in the way of foreign film, but the, what that did to kind of bring together the, the human realities of, of Nazi Germany was, uh, it, it, was, it was beyond moving. It was really disturbing, but also, uh, you know, this film had to be made. And who else but, but Dr. Wires to do that? Uh, and of course, we were all fascinated by the, the um, scuttlebutt that he, was a, he had been a spy. And uh, so his, his CIA background is like, wow, you know, is he still doing, being a spy every time he goes traveling somewhere? Is it, so he, he was a fascinating guy. And uh, then uh, to kind of round things out uh, at the, the end of the cycle of the honors uh, degree, uh, one of the options, or it might have been required, but it was uh, Wires taught modern Western intellectual history. And so to come back after having that year span of kind of from the Odyssey clear up to existentialism, and while he was kind of working us through Western civilization our freshman year, and working through particular uh, great uh, pieces, he was also giving us kind of the, the trajectory and, and basic patterns of, of, of history, of trends, of, of ways of, uh, of living. Uh. So getting into his intellectual history was to kind of relive and, and solidify a, a way of getting a handle on some of the, the trends that uh, Western civilization had gone through since the kind of the Enlightenment period, and to think about where we are as we continue to kind of go back and forth between some of the poles of Romanticism and, and rationalism and, and the, the conflicts that, that arise there. Uh, so that was a fantastic uh, piece, and I just felt really at home because I'd already had him in humanities, and it's like this, even after all these years, four years later, it, it's it was still within me, and uh, I began to realize how well he had taught that, that some of those contours of approaching intellectual ideas and history and how and why people uh, think and believe and, and organize themselves the way they do was, was, really, was really wonderful. And having existential literature gave me the courage to take a 400-level existential literature with uh, Paul Schumacher and. Uh, uh, in English, and I don't think I would have tried to do that without having at least a little idea that, yes, I could read it, and yes, I could make some sense of it, especially if there was someone to kind of help me along the way. And that was one of the most important English classes uh, that I'd ever taken, because in it I was able to do kind of philosophical as well as literary stuff. and. Uh, he was, he was one of those closet Christians, uh, Schumacher. I found out he was a Lutheran pastor. Uh, kind of kept that under the radar uh, 
I'm not sure that uh, English and literature folks were, were terribly kind to, to practicing Christians. Um, as I've talked to Dr. Hoseski, uh, Bruce Hoseski about uh, off and on. But uh, yeah, Schumacher knew my interests and in, in, in background in Christianity. And so he led me to different uh, Christian philosophers, um, Paul Tillich and uh, uh, Marcel, Gabriel Marcel. And I ended up using some of those philosophers to kind of write uh, a commentary, a philosophical inquiry into my mom's death. And uh, my family so appreciated uh, that write up, you know, three or four years later after her death, just thinking through what, you know, this, this struggle to be, to exist, and how that, that raised different reactions among us, how we could kind of interpret it. And, and uh, Gabriel Marcel was fantastic because, unlike Sartre, who says that uh, uh, hell is other people, Gabriel Marcel says, you know, hell is being alone. And so I could kind of examine philosophically that, that idea of community. And though we rub each other the wrong way many times, it's also the, the place that gives us an anchor and hope in the midst of uh, various struggles. So uh, I credit that span of fantastic deep literature from freshman humanities and the way that uh, Dr. Wires led us through it with being able to take a class like Dr. Schumacher's and, and feeling like I, I had a place at the table on that. And then outside of the classroom, you talked about Johnson Complex. So did you live there for, how long did you live there? Well, there's a sad story about where it started. And this was me as a dumb, naive high school senior, not realizing that the gods of uh, residential life are a lot harsher than any other segment of the university, I missed the housing deposit. Uh, and uh, my parents were none too happy when they found that out. And so the chance to live in, in uh, Botsford seemed to be pretty much gone. And my dad made me call Dr. Vanderhill to tell him that his incoming Whitinger had muffed the deposit. Uh, and Vanderhill said, we have no pull over there. <laughs> we, we can't do anything. They won't do anything. You, know, you miss a deadline, that's, that's it. And it's like, mm. But he said, you can try to get into Schmidt Hall. And so I could still be in the Johnson Complex. I just couldn't be in Botsford, Swinford, which were the primary honors uh, dorms. So I did get in there, and uh, I learned what it meant to, you know, how to do an inter- dorm transfer for the next year. But yeah, after that, I was in, in Botsford, uh, my sophomore, junior, and senior, or yeah, sophomore and junior year. Uh, then I went to Elliott Hall for, or maybe my senior, because I had two senior years. So I might have been there for three years after Schmidt Hall my freshman year. And no, it was, it was my fourth senior year because Cindy and Gary and Dave and I went all to Elliott Hall. Uh, and uh, uh, that was fun. I loved Elliott Hall. I loved Botsford and Swinford too, but uh, uh, Elliott Hall was, was just a different type of experience. The community though at uh, Botsford and Swinford was fantastic. We, we cooked a lot. <laughs> uh, somebody got in their head in our, my sophomore or junior year that we had to just cook a Thanksgiving dinner. So we had every single oven, Botsford, Swinford, and the residence hall director's oven, which was the only one large enough for a turkey. We had them all going, and we made our own Thanksgiving dinner. We had everybody down in the, um, in the, the, the basement rec area. And yeah, it, it, was, it was so much fun to think we could actually do that. And we had a lot of people at that Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, after Gary and Cindy and I went to uh, the first group of honor students that went to Westminster College in Oxford, we had fallen in love with uh, um, Indian food. Cindy had bought a cookbook, and we were trying to figure out how we could cook Indian. So every Friday when there was not uh, dorm, uh, the dorm food uh, wasn't open, uh, 
we would generally cook for ourselves and we discovered White Feather Farms, which was open on Saturday, and we could get all sorts of exotic ingredients that uh, weren't normally available, like fenugreek and turmeric and <laughs> a whole range of spices and stuff that you, you just couldn't get at the local marsh. Uh, and so we would, we would cook stuff up, much to the dismay of some people who thought that it all stank. Uh, but we, we tried all sorts of recipes and would cook Indian curries for Friday dinners fairly regularly. And we just had fun cooking together. Cindy's mom had, was, uh, had a family line going back to uh, Italy, Naples, I believe. And she had a fantastic lasagna recipe. So Cindy made lasagna one time. And so cooking was a, was a really cool thing that we ended up doing together and learning together, experimenting with. Do you think that sense of community, like, would it not have happened within the honors college with other honors students if you hadn't had that honors dorm to live in? I don't know how we would have done that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the indie thing started in part because at least three of us had been to England together, and we loved Indian food. And there, we found one restaurant in Broad Ripple, and we went there once, but none of us had tons of money to both go down to Indy and to uh, go out to eat. So we just cooked it ourselves. But um, not having a residential component in which we're taking similar classes together, you can always ask the upperclassmen about, you know, what does so-and-so do in this colloquium? And it, just kind of some informal peer mentoring, having the example of, uh, of upperclassmen, it just, it was a mini college within Ball State that gave us a community and, uh, possibilities that I'm not sure we would have pursued without having each other around. What do you think were like the biggest differences between the honors classes you took and non-honors classes? Um, I didn't really have to work terribly hard. Uh, some of it was just me being silly as a, as a kid and loving for instance, Greek mythology and, and having read as much as I possibly could on my own when I was a, a kid. So when I was taking probably classics and translation, and the final exam, it took like five, ten minutes, and I'm through, I don't know how many pages it was, and I'm turning it into Walter Moskalu, and, and everybody else is just looking up. And <laughs> but it, it wasn't hard because I already knew it. Um, other non-honors, it's, it's hard to say. Some of them were quite rigorous. The, um, the upper 300s and 400 level courses could be quite rigorous with both honors and non-honors because they were with majors. So the um, Chaucer course that I had with Bruce Hozeski was really, really hard. It was a 400 level course. There were graduate students in it. I loved it. I just love, he let us hear the language and feel the language and, and learning how to pronounce Middle English was just so much fun. And again, my kids would eye roll at this point. Uh, but uh, we, it was, it was pretty strenuous work. And uh, in retrospect, I could see where it, it had a continuum into graduate seminars that I would, I would later experience. I was dumb enough my sophomore year to, I was really interested in this class that, um, and I don't remember his first name, um, Professor Aquila in history was American historian, religious historian, and he had uh, early American religious history or religion in early America. I thought that sounded fascinating, and maybe it's because I was with honors kids. They, they didn't seem to think it was a big, big thing for a sophomore to take a 400 level history course. It was tough, uh, but man, it was so cool because you've got primary and secondary sources and interpretive things that I'd never encountered before. And it was the hardest I'd ever studied for a final exam. I wanted to understand this stuff and I found it so fascinating. It was the first time I had a structured 10 hour study plan that I did prior to the exam. And I, I wrote my own essay questions based on what we'd done in the syllabus. And then I'd test myself on it. And then I'd go back and check the sources. And then I'd set myself another essay. And uh, I hoped that it worked because it felt like I understood it better. And so I'm hesitantly knocking on Professor Aquila's 
office a couple of days after the exam. I said, uh, how'd I do? He said, wow, you did great. And I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, very excited that I could hold my own in a 400 level history class. Uh, but knowing that it took an enormous amount of time to do it because it was thinking on a level I hadn't been used to. Um, so I forget where this question started, but um, oh, it was taking non, non honors college classes. Uh, I guess it depended on the class. Uh, my health class, the general education classes tended to be really easy. I had very early on taken advice from somebody that I should take, uh, or that I had the opportunity to take things pass fail once, uh, once a term for stuff that wasn't in my major. So I did my general education all the way through <laughs> all, all four years or so of my uh, undergraduate. So I could one class, have one class I could just sit back and just enjoy it and know it, it's not gonna be hard to get more than a C for in this class. Well, I ended up getting an A in my health science class. It was also, I think, my freshman year, and I took it with another Whitinger, uh, Molly, who eventually married Eric Farnsworth. Uh, and Molly and I would sit through the history, or the health class. Well, I've uncovered in my, my magic bin of records a thank you note from the professor who said, you were one of 19 students who got an A in this class of 90 plus and I teach a lot of gen ed, and I know I'll never see you again, but I wanna thank you for paying enough attention to, to, give, um, uh, to give attention to the class, to care about doing well. And when I looked at that again, now having taught lots and lots of general education, and theology is a required course at Valparaiso University, and it has more than its usual amount of uh, tension involved with people feeling required to take theology, which I, I totally understand. But to see now on the other side, this guy who was willing to give me a thank you note for just doing my work, um, I really appreciated that even more now than when I received it first. So it sounds like overall the honors experience and Ball State was really great for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if there was anything about that time that you wish was different. Um, two things perhaps. One was uh, some of my good friends and acquaintances were taking an education track and they got the vibe and I, I did hear it from time to time that they were kind of wasting their skills and talents by going into teaching. And uh, I know at least for Cindy, who has done fantastic music education up in South Bend, schools needed somebody like her. Uh, now she's doing work with uh, children's choirs at Notre Dame. She teaches all sorts of alternative types of, of music. Uh, but that, that sense that the really successful students are the ones who are going to go on to become professors or to do big things like Eric became an ambassador. And, and it's like, especially in retrospect, we need good teachers out there. And how fantastic that some people felt called to work with kids who are, who are younger, who are not going to be college uh, kids and all. So that was a bit frustrating to, to have, have friends in the Honors College feel that they were kind of looked down on for having somehow screwed up the, the gift of their education by just becoming teachers. Um, and they, it wasn't all the time, but enough so that uh, it came up in conversations. The other thing that was kind of a regret in retrospect is a culture I continue to see with college students today is that uh, we continue to create a sense that you can do anything and everything. And smart kids, you should push them to do as much as possible. Um, thus, I ended up with two majors and three minors and five years. And too much of a habit of feeling like putting in the time was somehow equivalent to doing something well, as opposed to maybe doing less and doing it at greater depth better and taking care of my health. Uh, I was ill-equipped 
to enter graduate school because of that. Uh, there was no way you could read everything in graduate school anyway, but putting in more time, getting less sleep, was a recipe for disaster. I could get by on the undergraduate level with that, but I had to completely retune how I studied so that I would get regular sleep, so that I could think rather than just work. Uh, and it's, it's easy to want to encourage students to take as much advantage of everything that's before them as possible. But nobody asked me to kind of think about where it might be wise to cut down. Thus, the wisdom on my mother in retrospect that <laughs> it was, it's good not to do too much. And I find myself uh, as an academic advisor asking my students how much sleep they're getting. Um, do you really need to take 18 credit hours now? Uh, isn't it a better idea to make sure that you're doing maybe one major and one minor instead of multiple majors because you're going to get more out of it? and you need to have time to have fun. Um, so that experience, I know my profs were excited that you know, somebody's really into the stuff that they were into and that they wanted the best possible for students like me. But nobody gave a suggestion about when to put on the brakes for my well-being, for my ability to think well. And uh, I, was, I was pretty seriously um, health compromised my master's year. I remember very little of my master's year. It wasn't like I was hospitalized or anything, but uh, I was suffering from a type of fatigue that um, had not been helped by five years of go, 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 uh, without learning how to relax in the midst of everything, rather than only to collapse every single break, uh, which my parents, my stepmother, my dad were, were worried about. Um, rereading some of their letters, my dad's like, you know, don't work too hard. And my grandparents are writing me, don't work too hard, because they'd see me come home all pasty and hollow eyed and they didn't, they were really, really happy with what I was accomplishing, but they were also worried with the hours I was putting in. So those would be the only two things right off the bat I could think about that um, I had some, some reservations, regrets about. I feel like a lot of people still feel that way today, <laughs> like you were saying. Um, I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned earlier that you had traveled to England with some friends. So can you tell me more about that trip? Well, uh, again, it's kind of Whitinger Honors College related because uh, Vanderhill had worked to secure a place for 10 Honors College students to study at Westminster College in Oxford, which at the time was a United Methodist related Teachers College just outside of Oxford. And uh, so my sophomore year, there was kind of a competition. You wrote an essay about English higher education and uh, uh, to see who were the lucky 10 who got to, uh, now as a parent I'm thinking, the lucky parents that get to pay a lot to send your kid over to England. And we were just like excited, we got in, we got in. And the parents are paying well, as a Whiting here, they, they had certainly less to play overall. But anyway, yeah, so um, I, I've got all of the deadlines in my planner about, you know, write the essay, get it proofread, you know. I, it, and we were just so excited about the possibility. And uh, I remember uh, Cindy and I accosting Vanderhill in the hallway right after the, you know, we, we turned stuff in and we we're like, when are we going to find out? When are we going to find out? And he just, kind of playing coy. Says, okay, you're both going. And we were just, we were going crazy in the hallway and we were just swooping it up and probably disturbing all of the business classes because the Honors College office was still in the Whitinger Business um, Building at the time. Uh, and so Cindy and me and Gary and then uh, seven other students from the Honors College all went over to uh, Westminster College and uh, Vanderhill couldn't go. He was, he was going to lead the trip and ended up uh, Tony Edmonds and his wife Joanne uh, led us, which was fantastic. Getting to know Tony and Joanne, was, it was a hoot. They, they were so much fun. And getting to know their, their kids, uh, Tony and Daniel and uh, Sammy, although a few years later he demanded to be called Samuel. 
just to hang out with their family. They were, they were so much fun. There's so much energy. Um, I loved it. Uh, we had a, since the, our quarter started a good bit before the English uh, uh, fall term began, we had a couple of weeks of touring around England. We got a Brit Rail Pass, and the Edmonds took us to various places. We went up to Inverness, and we took the train over uh, to Kyle of Loch Ausch to see the Isle of Skye, and then train ride back. It's just gorgeous moors and stuff. We went to a, a really cool uh, wool shop in Inverness and uh, had some stuff tailored for us. And I was into cross-country skiing. Our family had uh, gotten cross-country skis sometime when I was in high school, and we had gone to various places, Pokagon and all. But I brought my skis with me to, uh, uh, to Ball State. And so I was going to get a pair of short pants for um, for cross-country skiing, and so I've got these nice tweed. Uh, I called them knickers, which was a mistake in, uh, in the UK, because I thought the tailor was gonna die of blushing because uh, that's underwear. And uh, it's like, well, one of those goofs, you don't, you don't know quite what all of the, the, the appropriate replacement words ought to be between American and UK English. So anyway, I got a very nice, tweed pair of uh, uh, short pants. Uh, so the, the touring was fun. Uh, the last weekend, we could kind of go on our own to use up the rest of the pass. Cindy and Gary and I went off to Wales and to all the places that we couldn't pronounce and just dropped off uh, at one place to see Conwy Castle uh, near and again, I'll butcher the Welsh near Flondudenau. And uh, we hauled our luggage up to whatever B&B was close. And uh, I remember just being really adventuresome on the food. And one of the, one of the things that you could have was white, fit or white bait. And no idea what white bait is, so I've got it. And it looks like a whole plate of cooked minnows, <laughs> whole. And uh, it's like, well, I ordered it. I do have a finite amount of money, and I worked my way through those whole little minnows as best I could. <laughs> it was it was a experience, so the, the the traveling was was a lot of fun. My uh, my friend Kim Rivers from high school, who uh, was at Earlham but was taking a year abroad in Aberdeen the same year I was in England. Uh, we met, I was able to go up on a break and I took the train up to, to Aberdeen and we spent a weekend together. And uh, it was just kind of weird and wonderful to think of the paths that we were on from this little county school. And that here we were both kind of immersed in medieval type stuff. We'd both been taking Latin. And here I was in England and she was up in Aberdeen. And I have to admit, I really was impressed with uh, she was there for a whole year, and I was thinking, you know, a semester's good. I, I kind of want to get home at the end. And there she was there through, through the whole winter, and believe me, Aberdeen is dark in the winter. <laughs> it, got, it got dark like 3.30 in the afternoon, and uh, it was very depressing. But uh, we had a lot of fun uh, hanging out, and then she came down to Oxford, and we did some pub crawls together, and uh, just really kind of needed the, the, the connections that, that just happen in life. You mentioned how you were both from a county school and I was wondering kind of how do you feel like growing up in that sort of like maybe rural environment influenced you? Mm -hmm. It meant I, I could never be totally comfortable in a city. Toronto was okay as a city. It was a very nice city. It was very safe. Uh, it was fascinating culturally, and if I had any hope of getting a job in medieval studies, I knew I had to go somewhere good. But I, I would get kind of depressed, and um, I just missed seeing the horizon. And uh, I had no money to get out except for um, through uh, the fencing team. And uh, I just felt kind of claustrophobic sometimes, There's so many people, so many buildings. Uh, I do remember hanging out sometimes at the, uh, the Medieval Studies was at Queen, uh, Queen's Park Crescent, which is just uh, north of the, um, 
parliament building, uh, provincial parliament building there in Toronto. And I would try to find some bushes where I could just kind of scoot myself amongst the bushes and feel surrounded by <laughs> especially if I was really down. I didn't have much money. Uh, just kind of hiding there, sitting on the snow and, and having bushes around me. <laughs> But I, I really like being able to feel comfortable visiting and taking advantage of the really cool stuff that uh, Edmund's helping teach us how to do the tube in London and how to take public transportation. That was, that was wonderful. I loved being able to do that. I just couldn't live there full time. Uh, so, um, yeah. And I'm curious about uh, your relationship with Warren Vanderhill. <laughs> He was, he was quite a character. I don't know why he chose me. I, I, I've, now, it may come across that I never have confidence in myself, but I had lots of very smart people in my class, uh, particularly like my friend uh, Kim Rivers. But I, and I was fourth in my class. The, the, other, the other three of my foursome in high school, were just, they're just brilliant. And so I was used to being around smart people, and I never would claim to be the smartest in a room because I knew they were smarter out there. But uh, <laughs> I almost thought I'd lead with this story, uh, depending on where your questioning was, uh, because it's related to the, the faith upbringing. I get this, this Whitinger interview, and of course I'm applying it to anything that will help bring money in. And to get brought in for an interview, I had no clue how to do an interview. I, Nobody was doing practice interviews at our guidance counselor. Um, so I'm, I'm coming in here and he's, everything's formal. I'm in my Sunday best and I was just scared out of my skull. I didn't know what to expect. He was very easy to talk to and he'd ask, you know, good questions like, what's your, what's the, what's the favorite book you've been reading lately? And I'd been reading uh, Quo Vadis, which is about uh, kind of a story set around uh, kind of after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, mainly focused around Peter, and the, the Latin title is, with one of the stories told about Peter, is that Peter's gotten sick of Rome, is scared, and is leaving it, and on his way out, he meets somebody who says, where are you going? Quo vadis. And it ends up Jesus, who kind of turns him around, encourages him, and Peter goes back and gets killed. Uh, but I'd been reading this kind of historical novel about early Christianity, and so we talked a good bit about that. But the question I knew that just blew it for me was, he said, well, in, in, in good interview fashion, you want to make sure that these, these smart people that you want to be the next generation of, of thinking leaders in the world that your university's putting out, you know, that they're also concerned about what's going on in the world. So he says, well, what do you think is the biggest problem in the world, or you know, something along those lines, and I I must have looked like deer in the headlights because I felt that way, and my heart's pounding, and uh, I'm thinking this is where I'm getting my faith tested, and I said, sin. <laughs> Now, later knowing that he's coming from this Dutch reform background, I'm sure he was just laughing in his head and thinking, yeah, I know where these people come from. But also as an interviewer and being involved in academia, it's like, man, that is the, that's the way you figure out people you don't want to be here. <laughs> I have no idea why. Having answered that way, he could kind of follow up and say, well, how about something a little bit more specific or you know, something to try to redirect me? And he, I, I'm just panicked and anxiety. And I, it's like, I said the right thing. I know I said the right thing, but I don't know where to go from here. And I, I have no recollection of what I said from there other than trying to say, well, I, sin does particular things to human beings that it, you know, I, I don't know, but it, it was. So somehow I made it through the interview he didn't crack up, which I, I would have I felt like doing if I were interviewing. It's, it's like, you know, push the button, this one's out. Uh, so, but I survived that. And um, he just was kind of like an uncle. He seemed to, to care a lot about us. He wanted to, 
He wanted us Whitingers to feel like very special people, which I don't know to what extent other non-Whitinger people really got sick of him being kind of um, snobbish <laughs> and, and elevating Whitingers over others. Uh, but for us within the group, we felt really special. We felt like we had something to live up to. Uh, I, I, or at least I personally felt like I had something to live up to. He had put his trust in me and I needed to fulfill that trust. I needed to make the most of this education that I was receiving. Uh, but he always felt so accessible. He was like, drop down anytime. And my dad had been in contact with him, especially during my freshman year since my mom was dying. And he was like, come in anytime you need to talk. Just, just sit here, you can chill out. I never really felt like I needed to do that because I had my friends uh, who, who were very familiar with my situation. Um, but he was very approachable that way. And even when he became provost, he was like, oh, just drop in, drop in. And I remember one of our uh, cheap hobbies was to go out to big lots, uh, me and Cindy and Gary and David and just find what happened to be there. It was open fairly late, so we could get odds and ends of things there. And we found this tide that had ducks flying, but they were flying upside down. And we thought it was just hilarious to have these ducks with butts in the air. But we also knew that Vanderhill liked hunting. And so we thought, you know, this would be fun. Let's just buy this and give it to Vanderhill. And uh, so Gary and I wrapped it up and we took it over to, to Vanderhill's office at the provost's office. And, and he was touched, and, but again, we felt like we could just go see him whenever, and, and that was really neat. Uh, played basketball with him. He, he did make it over to uh, uh, Westminster College. For, he was there for a week or so while we were there, and we all had a pickup basketball game, and that was, that was a lot of fun. So when you graduated Ball State in 1988, you headed to the University of Toronto to get your master's in medieval studies. So how did you end up at the University of Toronto? <laughs> I'll blame Kim. Um, actually, no, it has more to do with uh, the community of professors that I had. Uh, over and over again, they were so good at giving me advice about proceeding to graduate school what I should think about, what I should look for, and the willingness to write these uh, interminable um, letters, letters of reference. <laughs> um, and I don't remember which one in particular. It might have been Chris Shea in Classics. It might have also been talking to Tony Edmonds, but one or more people suggested that it would probably be a good idea if I got out of Indiana at some point. And my major awards were um, fellowships and, and stipends to do classics at Indiana University, full fellowship and stipends at uh, Notre Dame for medieval studies, and then nothing at Toronto. Um, I ended up going to Toronto. I got a whole $500 little bursary from the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies, which worked in conjunction with the department, the Center for Medieval Studies. So I entered the world of uh, student loans at that point, but the the dollar went pretty well in, in Canada, but it was very scary because um, I worked so hard on academics, I didn't really have time for a job and, um, well, not a paying job. I'd worked at Girl Scout camps with uh, and, uh, the equestrian units and I'd worked at um, uh, a Lutheran summer camp uh, up on Lake Michigan, so I didn't have much money. and I. Graduate school was pretty much on loans. So how did I get there? Well, I was told to get out of Indiana. And uh, uh, I trusted Kim a lot to have wisdom about her own career and what Toronto was like. Although I made a fatal error of, I'm desperately, I've got a deadline to decide who to accept and who to uh, reject. And I called her up and it was the middle of finals um, in the master's program, it's a one-year master's through the Pontifical Institute, and it's lots of mini courses interdisciplinarily, and your finals are all orals. And I called her during finals week. <laughs> and she was, she was willing to talk, but she could hardly be terribly excited about what was happening in her life at that moment. 
and was, was pretty, pretty honest about how brutal the regimen was. Um, and yet I still ended up going to Toronto. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so while you were getting your master's degree, I was wondering, um, I know you kind of mentioned you had to sort of rethink the way that you studied while you were there because you had so much work. But I was wondering if, the, if you felt the impact of honors at all with just having to do deep thinking or deep reading while you were there. At the time, I didn't have much time to think about how I was thinking. <laughs> but uh, I certainly had been given opportunities to have more confidence in my intellectual abilities through the Honors College. I knew there were smarter people out there than, than I was, but I also knew that I could hold my own and was periodically surprised that I was getting better grades than some of my friends when we would take courses together. Uh, and so thought, you know, I can probably do this stuff. I'm not, I'm not aiming to be the best ever. I just want to get through and complete this. So I'm not sure it was, it was the community of honors and the ability to get to know professors closely that I think was facilitated by being in the Honors College. Uh, and even if they weren't kind of specific honors professors, I, I grew to recognize that professors could be very accessible. They wanted to help out. They wanted to meet with students and work with them. So uh, I felt like I could kind of, that I could, I could make it okay. Um, yeah, I never really thought about that relationship other than I had been prepared because honors let me build a program that made me prepared. Uh, and I'd gotten experiences that allowed me to kind of curricularly uh, be prepared. One of which, oddly enough, was in, in history. Uh, I took uh, Dr. Kumulidi's uh, Byzantine history. Had no idea what that was. Sounded interesting, Eastern, you know. Uh, I took that course and was able to take uh, one of my research presentations. It was we basically did the history of early Christianity for most of the, the the early part of the Byzantine history class, and so I was studying some stuff on monasticism. That when it came up in my master's course in theology, it's like ah, I've been here before, and I ended up um, studying with a guy who had. Um, uh, Robert Sienkiewicz was my advisor. His advisor at Oxford had been um, uh, Timothy Ware, uh, uh, Bishop Callistus Ware, who's massive in uh, patristic Orthodox theology. Dr. Kumulides got Timothy Ware to come to Ball State. And uh, he came to our class and gave a presentation, got a picture of the 12 of us taking Byzantine history in front of what was then well, I guess, well, it's this building. I knew it as East Quad, and then it became Burkhart. Uh, so that connection with, through Byzantine history, and then Kumulides, and Ware, and then studying under Ware's, one of Ware's students was just one of those odd, cool coincidences that uh, were a continuity between at least Ball State generally and, uh, and my, my graduate program. And was this around the time that you met your future husband, Stephen? Yeah, it was. <laughs> he was living in the same house as my friend Kim Rivers. They, uh, they shared rooms in a, in a house. And so uh, Kim came to meet me at the airport. And um, Steve was with her because he had a truck. And so I, I got to meet them uh, right off the bat and then figure out where my housing was. And uh, so since I was hanging out with Kim, I ended up hanging out with Steve. Steve was really good at philosophy, and so I, was, I had him help me, um, and he offered to um, help me through the, uh, the philosophy, studying for the philosophy exams, which I had not done, except for Philosophy 101 with Cooksey, I really hadn't done much in the way of philosophy, so was really pretty ignorant that way, and felt really, I felt like I was entering into a different, it was just like a different language, I didn't understand it. Um, so he was really good at being clear and organized, and uh, he had publishable notes. He was just very clear and organized. So uh, we, we hung out more and more. Uh, uh, 
Pontifical Institute had uh, its own softball teams for the intramural leagues, one of which was the Papal Bulls, uh, which was, you know, the medieval students would laugh, ha, 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 we're not just bulls, we're these documents, and it's <laughs> dumb stuff that medievalists do. Uh, so we played softball together, and it just uh, eventually we're taking more classes together. In uh, we took a class together in classics on uh, um, kind of late an antique historiography and history, and then we took a early medieval class together, and then we started playing squash together, and we just hung out more and more, and eventually everybody thought we were already engaged, and so it. We finally get to the point where we're engaged, and, and Father Sienkiewicz was like, I thought you guys were already engaged. <laughs> it wasn't any big surprise to anybody except for us. And so I saw you two got married in 1993. Yep. Um, July 10th, 1993. And then in 1996 is when you got your PhD in medieval studies at Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, so how long were you pursuing that PhD? I think it was a total... Really, the masters counted. Nobody thought of the masters as an independent thing. It was just something that you got through to get to the doctoral. So the total there was from um, 88 to uh, to 90, 96, mainly 95 because I I ran out of money at that time, and so I turned in my dissertation uh, last minute in December of 95, and then had the defense the the following February or so. So about seven years, which was pretty much an average for us at the time. We had so many languages to try to um, to cover. Um, it, it just takes time. And I was lucky enough to have had a, a really good grounding in Latin here that allowed me to pass the PhD Latin um, by the end of my master's program. And a lot of people took it multiple times, including Steve, who just didn't like he didn't like studying for languages, didn't like the memorization and stuff. So it took him a while in part because he just didn't like it. But, uh, so, uh, yeah, we, um, seven years is a long time, but that's kind of what we needed. Did you know when you got, went to Toronto that you wanted to be a professor? No. I, I was kind of one of those people who was... Uh, you know, I don't think I want to teach in high school, but I don't know what else I can do, so I'll go to grad school. <laughs> now, that's me thinking back in my memory. I look at my letters, and as I'm writing to people and, and writing stuff down in my diaries or different stuff, I was aware I was going to teach. I don't remember being aware that I was going to teach, but obviously I was back then. Um, as I got into teaching, I realized that I was woefully ill-prepared to teach. I was... I was never good at escaping how I behaved in Dr. Wire's humanities class. <laughs> I just loved listening. I loved seeing what other people did. I loved the reading. I loved the writing. But I was really uncomfortable with speaking up. And, and more importantly, I, I just didn't know how to ask questions. I didn't know where the questions would come from. I just wanted to know stuff. And it probably wasn't until after my dissertation, after my... Um, uh, defense. And when I started having to teach that I started learning how to ask questions. <laughs> um, so yes, back then, evidently I knew that I, w I was going to teach. Uh, my own memory was I was completely clueless about what that meant. So uh, good history recognizes that current memory shapes the meaning of what happened as opposed to what the documents tell happened. So, but there was a real reality that I was clueless about teaching. I was terrified in front of a classroom. And it took a long time for me to feel comfortable in, in the teaching role. And you've said that after you got your PhD, you've called those next four years before you started teaching at Valparaiso a long waiting period. So can you tell me more about the different positions that you held during that time? Uh, taught some as an adjunct at Towson State, which I guess is now just Towson University in their history department, and taught uh, modern Western Civ, and I did taught a course in medieval history. 
Steve and I primarily taught at Loyola College in Maryland, which is now Loyola University in Maryland, I think. Uh, and combination of adjuncting, and they also had kind of full-time adjunct, they called it core professors. So if they had full-time available, they would clump it together and give you full-time, which gave benefits, which was fantastic. Because after having enjoyed the Canadian healthcare system, uh, coming to the States was, was a, a horrible um, kind of adjustment to how are we going to afford health insurance? <laughs> you know? um, but so we taught a lot at Loyola uh, in their general education curriculum, filling in when people had sabbaticals and, and just overall filling in curriculum, mostly, uh, well, eventually by the la third and fourth years, full time at that. But we also taught at um, um, St. Mary's uh, Seminary and University, which is uh, a massive Catholic seminary. And uh, they had a graduate unit that had formed in response to Vatican II that was aimed at lay education, and it was called the Ecumenical Institute. And it gave master's degrees in theology uh, and drew in a lot of really interesting people who were in the midst of a variety of other careers who wanted theological education. So we taught early Christianity, we taught uh, uh, spirituality, uh, I taught Greek once. Uh, but it was, it was a really neat place to be, and the, the director of that program was a great mentor, uh, helping us think through some uh, opportunities and how we would teach. And uh, Between him and the other faculty at Loyola, we got really great mentoring, even as we were terrified that we would have spent all this time and money getting degrees, and we had a good chance of not getting any jobs at all. So it was a long wait, yeah. Oh, and the other job that I took up was um, working for an engineering firm as a cultural historian uh, and having to do a crash course on kind of how you do architectural neighborhood history, American history, uh, with the tools of a medievalist. That, and, and this was a part-time job that came about because of our teaching at the Ecumenical Institute. One of our students uh, had her own engineering firm, uh, and uh, she was asking us if we knew anybody who might be able to do uh, this kind of work. And we talked about it, Steve and I. It's like, why don't we see if you can do that? <laughs> and she was willing to take me on, bless her heart, knowing nothing about architectural history, how you do these, these public research documents, the environmental assessment things that are necessary for any federally funded transportation uh, project and uh, to start doing community neighborhood histories to determine various forms of uh, impact on different routes that transportation corridors might take. It was a crash course. Uh, and it seemed like that was what I was gonna kind of be stuck with doing when we decided to give up academics. It would have meant another master's degree. <laughs> that must have been, like were you kind of feeling like, how are you feeling at that time when you were ready to give up? Like, was it sad or just anger? Oh, it was, it was, it was depressing. It was confusion, frustration. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the academic year does not help one kind of practice the Christian liturgical year because <laughs> Uh, all of the rejection letters start coming through in the midst of the Easter season. <laughs> and it's just really hard to, uh, to, to celebrate the resurrection as you hear, no, no, no. And uh, we got interviews. Uh, sometimes we'd be interviewed jointly, um, one after another, professional conferences. Uh, you know, you go to these cattle call interviews at the major conferences, and we'd have to go to the history one as well as the religion one. We didn't have the money. But we were going off to you know San Francisco or New Orleans, and um, I figured the thing that was most depressing about some of those cattle call interviews was uh, you kind of felt like a kid at an orphanage or a puppy at the pound, uh, hoping that somebody is going to pick you and take you and give you a home and a place. Um, yeah, so it, it was seasonally very discouraging and frightening. Uh, we, again, with the health insurance thing, we did not, well, as, as one of Steve's mentors uh, from his home church said, 
we just didn't have faith to start having kids. He says, God's my insurance. And bless Bill's heart. Bill was a fantastic guy, but uh, no, we did not have faith to start having kids without having some form of uh, health insurance that would last beyond the, our employment of nine months at a time. So uh, we eventually just knew that in order to really live and not keep putting off life, we'd, we'd have to give it up. But in 2000, you got the job in the theology department out at Valparaiso. You were tenured in 2004, became an associate professor of theology in 2009. So how has your experience been at Valparaiso, reflecting on these past 19 years? <laughs> uh, because it took so long, uh, whenever I get frustrated with my community or my students, or with uh, you know, trajectories in higher education, particularly church-related higher education, I just pinch myself and say, you got a job. The, the, the grace, the, the unlooked for, unexpected, and in many ways undeserved, I ended up getting a job and other people didn't. Uh, my husband was much better as an intellectual. He already had a book out. I got the job, he didn't. There's, there's no rhyme or reason. It's, it's, it's grace, it's mercy, and so I've got a responsibility to just do the best I can at it. Uh, that's been a number one thing. And the surprise of ending up a theologian was kind of, uh, I find uh, rather, I, I don't know, it, it, it tickles my funny bone on occasion because part of this coming out of Ball State that uh, uh, I got to know a little bit more about the Missouri Synod to know that it had a reputation of being uh, kind of anti-women and uh, anti-intellectual when in fact that had never been my experience. My pastor had always encouraged me. The way Cindy talked, I certainly recognized there's a lot of intellectual stuff going on there. Uh, I had a, a relationship, a mentoring relationship with the pastor down at University Lutheran in Indiana where my sister, my younger sister Stacy was going to IU and so I'd visit her and uh, we'd go to ULU and I got to talk to Pastor Hogue and Pastor Hogue was doing a doctorate in Byzantine philosophy, and so we had a lot of great conversations. And every step along the way, I had these fantastic experiences with smart leaders of the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. I, I knew smart people in the church, and I never felt like, as a woman, they weren't giving me credit for my intellect and how it could be used for the good of the church. Now, reality is I'm probably the only woman theologian in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod <laughs> uh, because uh, the Concordia system, which is the university system uh, sponsored by uh, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, will only hire ordained, uh, uh, ordained folks for teaching theology and only men are ordained. So uh, that leaves Valparaiso University as kind of a, it's an, it was always meant to be an inter-Lutheran kind of place. It wasn't founded by uh, any church body, just an interested group of Lutherans who wanted uh, really professional options for, uh, for Christians to send their kids in a Christian environment, but to grapple with Athens and Jerusalem. Uh, and so it was seen as kind of a pan-Lutheran space. Um, so that's why I, I may be the only woman Lutheran Missouri Synod theologian. Um, but yeah, so the opportunity to have a job is just something that I'm grateful for, that we could have a family, we have stable jobs. Um, yeah. What do you hope that students who come to your class get out of being there? Well, knowing how I felt as an undergraduate from middle America and knowing that it still kind of feels like the last place you want to go to to hear about your faith is from an academic theologian. I take very seriously, and I meet that right away in my intro courses. It's like, I'd be terrified if I were sitting where you are. I'd be afraid that things are going to be done to you to try to break your faith, but here's what I want to do. <laughs> and, and try to make them feel at ease. I tell stories about myself. And what I want them to come away with is whether or not you agree with it, to understand it as a system, to see it as a narrative and a particular view of reality that 
that operates holistically, but like any uh, worldview, is it's not it's not complete because full knowledge is incomplete. Whether whatever system, it doesn't matter if it's you know astrophysics or religion. There 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 are limits to how much we can see the big picture, and so I want them to come away with at minimum recognizing that. This is a legitimate way of trying to grapple with reality and understand the place of human beings and individuals within that large reality that is beyond what's tangible. Um, I'm also really concerned about teaching skills of writing and close reading. And the, the things I benefited from over and over again at Ball State, starting with that humanity, humanity sequence, is reading big, important things and trying to get students to get up to that and encourage them to, to think big, to see where these big questions are, to be part of that conversation. So I choose stuff that's hard. And I think that um, for a required gen ed class, that doesn't go over terribly well with everybody. But I want them to, to see that this, this could be exciting. This could be really uh, you know, enriching for a long-term career. Uh, and then just learning to read closely, learning to write clearly, succinctly, good details. <laughs> Things that were drilled into me by my English teacher in high school, but were uh, really carried out with, uh, you know, Dr. Wires kind of hit, hit me where I already was. Like, I've got to keep doing this. I've got to keep doing this. And then uh, I saw in 2006, 2007, you took a sabbatical. Um, can you tell me more about the research that you did during that year? Um, a warning to anybody who answers a survey online. Uh, I had been using some books out of Westminster John Knox for my uh, intro course, kind of a, an overview, it was kind of historically chronological. And the publisher sent out a survey of what kind of books might you be able to use in future classes. So I'm writing this up, and I'm writing some responses to, to kind of clarify how it can be used in our context, whether or not I could use it, whether or not our department could. And the, an editor wrote back and said, would you write a book for us? <laughs> uh, I was pregnant with our second child and still struggling with feeling like I could teach. Uh, and it was like, there's no way. <laughs> On the other hand, if I don't do it, then I'll never do it. And so I, I agreed to do it. The editor, uh, Don McKim, was fantastic, very, very uplifting, always encouraging. And I'd give him a little bits and he'd say, this is, this is just what we want. And so the research that went into it was, um, I was never a great researcher either, um, at least compared to, to folks that I admired. And I always felt like I needed to know way more than what ended up being on paper. So since I hadn't been trained kind of professionally as a theologian, I, I think that Steve and I both expected we'd be teaching in history, but our teaching experiences came over and over again in theology. Uh, so I was hired as a theologian. Um, I, I did too much initial research trying to catch up on decades worth of scholarship on Old and New Testament, <laughs> uh, both as scripture and as theological. And uh, it took forever to write that first chapter, which was to introduce where the Jewish and Old Testament story made a, a made Jesus make some sort of sense as to why people would either be for him or against him. It took forever to do that biblical chapter because I had not been trained in it. And um, I just felt like I had to do a lot of background reading to see what are the streams of the questions that are necessary for a textbook oriented thing. So students know what, what are the major trends? What, uh, what are the major contributors to understanding Jesus and Christianity coming out of kind of Old Testament, uh, Second Temple Judaism, and that took forever. And I, I thought my husband was just going to lose all of his hair over how most of my sabbatical, I think, was spent trying to do that chapter, which meant I was writing the rest of the book while I was teaching. And now I got further along than that, but a lot of my energy was not wisely spent because I didn't know how to write a textbook. And I started with a part that I didn't know, and I should have started with the parts I did know and then kind of worked backwards, but you learn a lot by writing something like that. 
<clears throat> I am curious about kind of what are your, you know, after you've done all these different things, you've written a book, what are your professional aspirations for the future? Uh, I'm kind of at a, a turning point. I'm going to apply for full professor next fall. I've been trying to finish off uh, a series of uh, research-oriented articles about um, kind of the dynamics of pastoral care and life within, a con within congregations uh, in, in early Christianity, particularly in the East, fourth, fifth century or so. And I've done a lot of work on homilies, trying to look at the dynamics of what the pastor's saying and imagining from those clues what's going on in the congregation, where are the, the points of tension. So having done several articles on a scholarly vein that way, I think what I want to do is kind of give back to the community and do more of a lay level book that looks at aspects of um, you know, the life of believers in early Christianity, uh, pastoral care, the tensions there. How do you take care of people who have so many, they're coming from so many different places, socioeconomically, intellectually, uh, just because I think people in the church today could probably benefit from recognizing there's not that much different about uh, the things that we struggle with and trying to find a way of passing on things that we care about, of forming people in their characters, in the way that they give back to the community, in the way that they understand uh, the way that God works and how they can be drawn into that. But how do you teach pastors how to develop that and how do you uh, assess uh, where people are at and what they need and how do you create those things? And then from the, the, uh, the believer's standpoint, how do you begin uh, thinking about offering opportunities or, or kind of reaching out for those opportunities. So a lot of this has come, a, a lot of my research questions actually have come out of adult education courses I've done at our, we've got a very large parish uh, up in Valparaiso. It has a school attached and they've always been, they've, they were kind of the university church for, for quite a while. So it, they've always had kind of professionals in there as well as uh, a whole range of political views, whole range of socioeconomic things. And so in that way, it's a really great place to have that variety. And so I've, I've been really glad to be able to offer some adult ed in those contexts. But I've had people ask, you know, well, how did the early Christians solve this? Or they'd raise a question of, you know, we're Lutheran. How come we do this Lenten thing? How come we do these spiritual disciplines? They seem like a good thing to do, but why do we do it? And so I go back to the early church and say, well, what is the role of them? What's the purpose of them? How, how do you kind of latch on to these things in ways to open up to the, to the power of God and recognize that it takes a community to help you to do that? So my whole spew of pastoral articles on a scholarly level were in great part kind of provoked by adult ed teaching and the types of questions that uh, uh, you know, my brothers and sisters were, were asking. I was like, I don't know, but I, I know where I can start finding out at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think my trajectory may be, if I think I got it in me, to do a, a book-length uh, kind of study of pastoral care and congregational dynamics that would be uh, kind of aimed more to lay audience. And my context in Valparaiso is that they, they, they want scholars to both you know, serve the scholarly community, but also to kind of give back to uh, the, the church community as well. So it, it's part of my... Uh, part of my job to get to do that. Well, we have a little more than 10 minutes left, um, so I wanted to get out of the nitty gritty for a second. Okay. I just want to ask you about um, your son, Nathaniel, who's yep. born in 2001, and then Zoe in 2004. Can you tell me a little bit about them? Uh, Nathaniel's doing the college search thing right now, and unlike me, he has a better idea of what he wants to do. I'm not sure yet that he's kind of determined how he's going to organize himself in order to get there, but uh, it makes college searching a little easier. He wants to do music and pre-med. <laughs> so uh, finding, uh, finding colleges where those two might go together uh, has made it easier to kind of narrow down what <laughs> where to look. Uh, he plays oboe and English horn and loves that. Uh, has always loved singing, and our church school has a rather impressive uh, vocal music program, uh, the 
uh, the audition only middle school choir has been asked to sing with the Bach Institute at Valparaiso University for things like the St. Matthew Passion uh, to sing together with professional musicians and they're, they're just that good. Um, so he's always loved singing. Uh, he hasn't been able to do that much in high school, but uh, he just joined the uh, Northwest Indiana Symphony Chorus this past spring. And because he wanted to do, kind of explore his voice and get some training, uh, started taking voice lessons with one of the, the VU um, uh, voice instructors who's with the Chicago Lyric Opera. And uh, so he loves music. He loves cross country because he likes the guys that, that hang out there. They're a great community, and he thinks he gets better conversations there, more, more viewpoints he gets there than in the classroom where there's only kind of, there's, there's a party line. <laughs> uh, but he and his friends can go all over the place. So he, he loves cross country, not for the sport, but because he has people he can talk to and talk about cool things. So that's, those are some of the major things with Nathaniel. He loves cadaver labs. <laughs> and then Zoe? Zoe uh, lived up to her name, uh, which means life. And uh, she is just, she makes everybody smile. Uh, and she's just got energy oozing out of her to the point that it tires the rest of us out sometimes. Very, very social, very interactive, exceptionally um, attentive to details around her, particularly kind of emotional social details. She, she reads situations and people just brilliantly uh, and has always been able to do that. She, she knows where there's a need and she'll go and do something about it and she's wise amongst her friends and still is willing to talk to us about struggles that she has and um, she, she stays apart from some of the click things that go on which you can imagine in a, a, a class at, her, at Emmanuel, the Emmanuel School classes range from about 20 to 30, and you're with the same group then for you know eight or nine years, clicks happen. So, but she was able to kind of be part of everybody's click. Um, so uh, I admire her wisdom. I admire her energy. She's, she's never going to, peer pressure is never going to be a problem for her because she's too ornery for that and too independent for that. Uh, the flip side of that is being a parent with that kind of personality means there's a lot of conflict because she knows what she wants and why she wants it and on her schedule. But uh, she works hard. She is up all hours making sure she gets her homework done. And right now she's fourth in her class of 560 or 70 uh, while doing, um, uh, she was on JV soccer this fall and is doing track this spring and doing club soccer this spring. She also loves music. She loves babysitting. She loves dogs. She's trying to train her dog, Tigger, a golden retriever, for uh, visitation. Um, my sister, Stacy, has done that with her dogs, and so Zoe's been kind of working with her dog to, to do kind of hospice visitation and stuff like that. Well, before we finish up, I just wanted to ask, um, is there anything you wanted to talk about today that we did not get to? Well, one thing that made a difference to me that went from Ball State clear through graduate school was fencing. Um, back when Ball State did phys ed as hobbies and sports, uh, we had to sample like six or so. I had always been fascinated with fencing. I had these medieval interests, so kind of sword related stuff when I was in high school. So doggone, I was going to take fencing. And several of us from uh, Johnson Complex would toddle down at eight in the morning for fencing class. And um, I got to know some folks after taking the, the, two, the two fencing courses, and we would fence off and on. And uh, uh, the one Christmas, family members bought me the different pieces of a whole fencing outfit, so I could do that with friends at the field house throughout the rest of my Ball State career. So when I went to Toronto, I um, knew I wanted to do something that would get me out of the library, get me out of the books, get me away from other medievalists. And uh, I took a continuing ed course in fencing that uh, I just wanted to be you know, re refreshed on what it was. And I knew it had been a while since I'd actually had lessons. And I was invited to try out for the team uh, and ended up being on the, uh, the Varsity Blues for University of Toronto for five years, which is unlike the NCA, four years, the, uh, the Canadian system has a five year and there's not an age limit. So even as a graduate student, I could, I could be on the varsity team. 
And that was so much fun uh, to be able to do that, to be able to be on a team. In many ways, I felt like I had been given a gift that had been taken away from me from playing basketball, that here I was being able to be a collegiate athlete and uh, just had a fantastic time. The coach was this ancient guy. He, he was in his late 70s, I'm sure, but tough as nails. He had been with the British Expeditionary Forces that landed on Normandy, He'd been a sergeant uh, in, the, in the military, and he was fun. He, he's just enormously honored kind of internationally as a fencing master. And here he was just so approachable, kind of bringing us along uh, as best we could wherever we were at. Uh, and, and the fencing really was a fantastic part of my, my graduate schooling that fencing at Ball State made possible and uh, having uh, some friends uh, from uh, Johnson Complex that we could kind of hang out with some of the other folks that we'd, we'd met up and just, let's, let's go fence for an afternoon. Do you ever get to fence today? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's an hour to an hour plus to Notre Dame where they've got a club. It's an hour plus to St. John's where they've got a club, and that's not good stewardship of my time. So I had the fencing; it was fantastic. Um, now I've got other things. Well, that with that, we'll bring our interview to an end. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for this. This has been so much fun. Thank you. Yeah, on behalf of the Ball State University Honors College Oral History Project. I want to thank you, Professor Driver, for participating in our project.